My name's Ailsa Head and I was born on the 22nd of the 737. I grew up on a dairy farm at Munna Creek and um, from the age of 10 I went to boarding school in Brisbane and uh, it was great. I loved boarding school and I was there for uh, six years and came home and worked for a solicitor's office here in Maribyrnong for a while. Then I had to go home and work on the farm. And uh, I just loved my girls, my cows, my calves, my pigs. Uh, that was my life, uh, rearing uh, calves and pigs. I read over a thousand Jersey calves and uh, looked after all the pigs and things like that. And that was, uh, I enjoyed that. And uh, I was home on the farm until 1970 when dad sold the farm nearly broke my heart and uh, took me a couple of years to get over that and uh, the day that the people that bought it um, they didn't know anything about farming we had to show them how to put the cups on the cows um, they lasted about six weeks didn't like milking cows so they had a big sale sold all my girls and I stood in the cow yard and I bawled my eyes out and uh, that was uh, that was pretty sad, but uh, you get over it. And uh, when we left the farm, um, couldn't get a job because I'd had no experience in anything else. And uh, went to um, Dad bought a house at Alexandra Headlands, and uh, I was living there. And one of the neighbours um, got me a job as a vet nurse in Brisbane, and I was there for two and a half years until I got married. Uh, did a course at uh, university, animal, uh, the thing that vets do, uh, vet nurses do, and uh, I enjoyed that. Um, sat for two exams, got honours in both, and didn't finish it unfortunately because I got married the following year. And after I got married, uh, we went to Western Australia. My husband was working in the mines for Hammersley Iron, and we were there for, I think, six or seven years. And um, it, was, it was good, uh, one of the mining towns. Uh, they had all the facilities, all the sporting things. And when we came home, my husband got a job with uh, one of the firms that um, used those big, uh, big mining trucks. And uh, we went to Cairns and he worked out at Kidston. And then later on, um, he was transferred to Singleton because the mine down there had the trucks. So he spent his time between there and, and uh, Kidston up in North Queensland. And after a while, um, marriage broke up. He found a girlfriend up there and uh, that was that. So I came home and uh, later on I went to Cairns uh, because we both like Cairns and that's where we were going to live eventually. So I thought the town was big enough for both of us and it wasn't likely I'd see him. So went up there, couldn't get a job. Uh, by this time I was in my 50s and I uh, couldn't get a job. I got a volunteer job at the Teachers Resource Centre and uh, the ladies there were very good. I did filing and all that sort of thing that the teachers needed done. And eventually I got a job uh, with um, souvenir warehouse and uh, that was good until the airstrike and nobody was buying souvenirs so I got put off so I was on the dole again and uh, very hard to get a job up there uh, you know at that age so I was off for a while um, after that and then I managed to get a job by word of mouth from the doc from my doctor um, he had a client who uh, who's Husband had a pet control, a pest control business, and um, I got an interview with them. And uh, I didn't expect to get a job because I had no computer experience or anything. And they sat me down in the office and asked me questions: Can you use a computer? No, but I can learn. And uh, they said we don't want a young one because they're not reliable. And then he said you can start on Monday. Well, I nearly fell off the chair. But so I had a job and I worked there for five and a half years till we left Cairns. And uh, while I was up there, 
living in the caravan park. Uh, I met my present husband and uh, we eventually got married up there and we were living there for, um, I was up there for about 10 years and then uh, Dad passed away and we came home to Maribyrnong and we've been here ever since. Now it all started off uh, back in 1883 when my ancestors came out um, with the Lancashire Cotton Company. They sent three groups of people out to grow cotton because at the time the, they couldn't get, um, the mills over in England couldn't get uh, cotton because of the American Civil War. So they sent uh, three groups out and my ancestor was in the first group uh, leading that and they settled up at Pioneer's Rest and they were there for quite some time and I don't think the cotton really took off. And later on they went into timber and sugar and eventually Dad's grandfather took up the selection uh, where our farm was now. And um, they were, Dad's father was brought up there and uh, his brother and later on uh, they moved to Netherby, uh, had on a farm down there. And uh, Dad grew up there, went to school there and uh, gradually uh, later on he got jobs away from the farm. And uh, later on um, he was virtually told that he had to get married because um, his uncle, which was his father's brother, he was running the farm with share farmers and it wasn't working out. So uh, in those days, the parents were, were pretty strict. And uh, Dad was, he was going with Mum at the time and he was virtually told that it had all been arranged, he was going to marry Mum and go up and work on the farm, which happened. And uh, so he had virtually no choice. Uh, his father said, this is what you're going to do and you're going to do it. So uh, Dad eventually took over the farm and he was a pioneer in irrigation in the area. He was the first one to introduce um, irrigation in the area. And at the time, the other local farmers were pretty sceptical. They even went to the stage of taking samples of water from the river and sending it away for analysis. And they came back to Dad and said that uh, the tests show that the water wasn't fit for irrigation or suitable for irrigation. And Dad told them, well, it comes from up there, so uh, it's, you know, it is suitable. So he got, uh, bought some sprays and some pipes, started irrigating, and uh, gradually the people came to realise that it was a good thing, and he started that in the district. Then uh, later on, he started hay baling, because in the drought there was, you know, no unless you stored hay and things, you had nothing for the cows to eat in the droughts. So he started uh, hay baling at home on our place and uh, gradually some of the other farmers would ring him up, say, can you come and bale my crop of lucerne or oats or whatever it was? So it became a very, uh, very busy business. And uh, he was a pioneer in quite a few different areas um, of farming in the area. I, uh, I was responsible for rearing the calves and the pigs and uh, I helped out in other ways as well. But uh, I love my girls. They were, uh, we were milking about 120 cows, which was a big farm at that time. The normal farm was about 60 or 70. But uh, we were milking 130 and uh, sending cream to the butter factory at Gympie on the train. But later on, of course, milk came into being. And rather than uh, put in uh, stainless steel tanks and everything for holding the milk, um, my father wasn't interested and he was more mechanical minded. He wasn't interested in milking cows, nor was my brother. So they took the opportunity um, to go out of dairying and when the milk came in and uh, we partly went over to beef cattle as well but with the hay baling and that, there was plenty to keep them going. But um, no cream sort of went out of, of fashion then. The factory in Gimby uh, changed over to milk and casein and that sort of thing. But uh, it wasn't viable to put into big tanks and everything for the tanker to come and pick up. 
So uh, we virtually went out of out of dairying. We were still dairying, but not not uh, to milk. Uh, when when the war was on, Mum and Dad were volunteer spotters, and uh, when the planes went over, they had binoculars and they had to look and ring up somewhere, I don't know whether it was in Meribor or Brisbane, and tell them how many engines it had and they, they were given pictures of different planes and they had to sort of identify what sort of plane it was and how many engines it had and they would ring up this certain number every time a plane went over if it was, you know, low enough for them to identify it. And um, only just a quite a few years ago, um, I got two certificates come in the mail, um, thanking them for their, their work, their volunteer work doing that. So that was only a few years ago that I got those. So, uh, but I, I can remember that as a kid, you know, when the planes went over, they'd run out and, and then they'd ring up this, this place. Uh, during the war years, we used to grow a lot of potatoes. And come potato time, we might have 10 or 12 neighbours coming to help and they'd bring them in here to Maribra, um, to Negus's, and, um, and they'd go wherever they went. But uh, when we used to have the picking on, sometimes mum, we had a big long table in the dining room, which, which sat about 17 or 18 people. And sometimes she'd have all these pickers there for a hot meal in the middle of the day. And uh, if Dad would go, if somebody wanted hay baling, if there was a storm coming, all the neighbours would come and load the bales up to get them in the shed before the rain. And it was a, it was a, a place where everybody sort of helped, you know. If somebody needed something, um, everybody sort of, you know, joined in and helped. It was, it was a good, good community. Oh, swaggies came everywhere, yes. Um, that was a thing. I think there was a, a grapevine um, that they knew where to call in because we were on the main main road and um, they used to come in and mum used to make big packets of sandwiches and give them some, you know, loose tea for their billy. And quite often the kids, we rode about nearly two, two miles to school on our bikes and often coming home, the kids would be riding home and there'd be a swaggy there and, you know, they'd talk to him and then he'd come in. And uh, so we quite often had swaggies coming in, you know, they'd stand at the fence and sing out, are you there, missus, you know, and mum would make them up a big, big packet of sandwiches and stuff, cake and stuff and give to them. So uh, we got quite a few, I can remember quite a few came and... Uh, so there must have been a grapevine that they all knew where to, you know, where to go for a good feed. And then you'd see them down by the big lagoon with the, they'd make a little fire and boil their billy. When, you, when we were kids, we didn't come to town much, but when we did come, Granny would look after us and she'd take us down to the gardens while Mum did the shopping. And in those days, up until the 50s, they had monkeys in the garden and parrots in the cage and they wished to sit there and watch the boats. And uh, coming to town was a, you know, it was a treat in those days. But uh, Granny used to look after us. And I remember standing on Bryant and Ferguson's corner, where the jewellers is now, uh, watching the five o'clock, watching the five o'clock whistle. There were all the fellas on the bikes. I can still see that. I can see it as clear as anything. I was only a little kid. But uh, all these fellas on bikes, um, it was it was it was real. They've got that mural there on the town hall green now, uh, the five o'clock whistle, remembering all that big workforce down there. When warpers were making their ships and everything, they employed twelve hundred men alone. You know, plus the sugar factory, the sawmills, the foundries, uh, big workforce down that end of the town in those times. But uh, all gone now. That's what we need. We need some industry. Music was always a big part of our home. Musical gatherings around the piano at night and sing songs and things like that. It was, it was great. And there was a local dance every Saturday night in those days, tennis on Sunday. But now none of the halls are used around home. Um, there's no, no tennis, no 
no cricket, no uh, dances, but, which is a bit sad, but that's the times, I suppose. Yeah, I worked at home on the farm after I left school. Um, worked in for Morton and Morton here for six months, and then uh, Dad's uncle that he was in partnership with on the farm, he decided he was going for a trip overseas, and I had to come home and take over rearing calves. So I was there till 1970. Mum was a very quiet, reserved sort of a woman, wonderful cook. She was known for her sponge cakes and her 21st birthday cakes and wedding cakes, all cooked in a wood stove. She'd put her hand in the oven, she'd know the right temperature. And uh, she was well known for her, for her wedding cakes and things like that. But uh, she was too, we were too flat out. She didn't sort of have much of a social life, but uh, she was always there and uh, in the background, but she was a, an essential part of our, our background. I went to the little Munna Creek School, uh, which was, I think there were the most was there was about 16 or 17 kids, one teacher. And uh, the, most of the teachers that came there were all women and they all ended up marrying local farmers. And one of them that was teaching me uh, she suggested to my parents that I, I should go to boarding school because I was quite good at school. And um, so I went to boarding school, uh, Morton Bay Girls High School it was then, which is now Morton Bay College, which is one of the better known schools in Brisbane, all a day school. We were all boarders in those days, all country kids. And uh, that was great. You could learn the piano, you could play sport, you could do all sorts of things. So I really enjoyed boarding school. When we came back to Maribor after Dad died, um, I was looking for things to do and uh, too old to get a job anyway. So I decided to do volunteer work. So I went down to the bond store. Somebody suggested I go there. And yes, we, we need volunteers. So I started there in, I think it was late 1997. And then a fellow I work, I put on on a Thursday. And the fellow I work with on the Thursday suggested, why don't you go up and see Ken at Brendan Garrity's? He's always looking for volunteers. So I went up and saw Ken, yes, uh, we can put you on. So I think I started there early in 19, 1998. And I've been there ever since. I'm still cataloguing been cataloguing for 18 years and I'm still not finished, but I enjoy it. But uh, when I started to work at the Bond store, I came to realise what history we had here. And it, it sort of, over the years, it became a passion. And uh, I started researching here and uh, done a lot of work on the port, the shipping and Meriba in general and I've got a bedroom full of folders and stuff, which my husband says, <laughs> all that junk. But uh, no, I've, I've really, really enjoyed it and it's become, I can sit and research all day. And it's, of course, it's helped me uh, with my, when I do the walk, you know, you can tell people about the history. But the history is just, we've got so much history here and it's so, so interesting. There's so much to tell people. And I, I just really enjoy doing it and you learn things all the time and uh, we have our little history group that I go to and uh, anything that uh, George Seymour does walks about things about architects and things and they're really interesting so you learn you're learning all the time new things that you didn't know so uh, it's just great and then up at Brendan Garrity's of course um, all the uh, We've done all the 10,000 bits from under the floor and just about everything in the store. So we're getting there. I'm working on the paperwork at the moment, but uh, it never, it'll never be finished there, but I enjoy it. And then the information centre, of course, uh, that's great. Um, people coming in, you meet people from all over the world, uh, telling them what we've got to see here. And uh, a lot of people are really surprised um, a lot of people have been told, oh, there's nothing to see in Maribor. And when they get here, they find that there's, you know, there's really a lot to do and see here. 
and they're quite surprised. So it's, it's really good to be able to introduce them to what we've got here and uh, I really enjoy that. Uh, when the centenary of the City Hall uh, came about, I decided I would do a, a book. So I got together all the stuff I could find about City Hall and uh, at the time Barbara Hobart was, was the mayor then and um, she sort of helped me to get it uh, photocopied and uh, I got it printed. I said I just printed it all myself and put it together and uh, because I couldn't afford to get it, you know, uh, professionally printed. So it's, it's a homemade job but um, I enjoyed doing it and uh, uh, unfortunately after I'd done the book I found out that Dame Mel Nellie Melbourne sung in the town hall in 1900 oh, 1909, which, uh, which I, I missed out on getting in the book. So that was something that I wished I, I could have put in the book. But uh, City Hall's got an interesting, interesting history. In those days, it was the focal point for all social occasions. Dinners, balls, dances, meetings, concerts, everything was held in the town hall as it was known then. And the other one, uh, my favourite ship that I've done in research is the Burwa and Captain um, Jimmy South. And I decided there was always a lot about it in the paper. So as I've been going through getting information on the ships, uh, I pulled out everything I had about the Burwa and I uh, did a book about that, all from the Chronicle, of course. I'm doing Dad's story. For years and years, I've pestered Dad to do his story and he never would and then eventually he did it and he did six tapes. So uh, I've typed it out and uh, I didn't know how about going it, you know, to do it in book form. So there's a lady in our history group that offered to do it for me. So I've, she's done the six tapes and with some photos, I've got a lot of photos out, you know, from home and that that's in the book and uh, always been interested in the family history I'm the only one in the family that is so I thought I'll never get a chance to do it because it's so you know so time consuming so I thought I'd just do dad's line from his grandfather down and uh, he was one of the ones that was born oh, he was he came out when he was five years old with the cotton people and I thought I'd just do his line coming down through uh, Dad's father and Dad and all the kids and their kids and that sort of thing. So that's what I've nearly finished at the moment. I've just been trying to get photos from rallies and everything. So I've just about got it together. So I'm determined to, to get it done. Something I always wanted to do. But uh, Dad, he just told it as it was and I just typed it as he said, so uh, it's, uh, it's just how he, how he talked. So I've just done the same thing in the, in the type area. So hopefully I'll get it done this year sometime. At home on the farm, you just accepted what you had to do. I mean, when we were kids, you had to do jobs before you went to school and uh, it was just, you didn't think anything of it. You just got in and did it, you know, it was just part of life. But uh, as I got older, you know, and you look around and you think, you're, oh, you know, you're not, life's not real good. But when you look around, you see that you, it's not so bad for you after all. There's plenty worse off than you are. So you take for granted, you don't take for granted what you have. You, you know, you just do it. <laughs>